I would like to do a brief review now for quiz number one, which covers the beginning material. Um, so there are a couple of lectures here that introduce the idea of open and closed forms during the common practice period. So you should know the definition of open and closed. So closed basically is something that follows a preconceived plan. Uh, open is something that is more improvisatory. And I gave you some examples in the Baroque period of open and closed um, and that Baroque composers were fond of coupling together opposite ideas. They would keep the same basic mood um, and thematic material a lot of times uh, in a, a single movement, but then they would couple that with something that formed a sense of contrast. So uh, the element of form was often something that uh, was used in that way. So examples that I mentioned were uh, like the prelude, which was an open form that would be coupled with a fugue, which is a good example of a closed form in the Baroque. Um, other examples that were coupled with the fugue, um, I mentioned the toccata um, and also the fantasy or fantasia uh, and fugue. So uh, those are some examples. I also gave you uh, the example of a recitative and aria which would be coupled together in the Baroque opera. And um, so the recitative was something that was more improvisatory and speech-like, and the music to serve the purpose of expressing clearly the text. So it would be presented over uh, a very sparse accompaniment and was syllabic, so it had a very speech-like quality and, and declamatory. And that then would be coupled with the aria in which the character um, would then reflect upon the action that was expressed in the recitative. And so it was more um, of an emotional kind of um, response. And the da capo aria was the form that develops at the end of the 17th century and is something that is a good example of a ternary form in the Baroque. So other closed forms that I mentioned were binary form associated with dance movements. So that is something which Corelli really helped to establish. And then that becomes the basis from which Sonata Allegro form emerges in the 18th century, so in the middle part um, of that century. And um, so Sonata Allegro form is, is an elaboration uh, upon binary dance structures from the Baroque. So that's one uh, closed form in the Baroque. And then I also mentioned Ritornello um, and that basic uh, you know, principle um, that was used in fast movements of Baroque concertos. And so uh, those are examples of open and closed during the uh, Baroque. So in general, I mentioned the fact that the classical era uses more closed patterns. So there's more a sense of uh, predictability and the listener has uh, you know, a greater sense of expectation as far as what type of form will be used with which particular movement. So go over the different forms that are associated with the classical symphony. So you should know for each movement uh, what forms are associated. So those were some just introductory uh, remarks about uh, form. And then I mentioned something about the Romantic era being a more geared toward individual approach toward form. They took classical forms as a starting point, but then uh, molded them so that they uh, fit the emotional uh, context of the work. Um, and so 
Um, also the idea of cyclic um, techniques of tying together um, multiple movements in something like a you know, Beethoven symphony and then you know, many later examples of that. Berlioz Symphony Fantastique is a good example of, of that idea of cyclic uh, construction that's projected over an entire uh, you know, large scale work. So, um, and then chapters one through six, that is a discussion of the smallest elements in music. So you should be able to um, describe a figure and a motive and the difference between those. So basically they're both short, shortest units of music with the figure being something that's more generic like an Alberti based figure. Um, whereas the motive is something which is the shortest thematic unit, so something that the composer will develop. So, you know, we'll sequence. The uh, most famous example of that is the fate motive from the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. So, uh, should be able to describe those. And then we used the term semi-phrase within the context of discussing a phrase. So a phrase is the shortest unit that is terminated by a cadence. So a semi-phrase would be something typically is half the length of a phrase. So we said that the basic length of a phrase is four measures. And so that's always the starting point in looking at a work is that you uh, would look at it in four measure phrases and then you could look at it in shorter or longer phrase lengths um, and typically it would be because of aspects having to do with the tempo and the meter and so if it's um, a really fast tempo and in 3-8 I gave that as an example then you might look at it in eight measure phrase lengths um, or if it's an adagio tempo 4-4 four, four, and you have 16th note subdivision of the beat, then you might look at it in two measure phrase lengths. But the thing is, you have to be consistent in the way that you look at the basic length of a phrase in a work. And so the rule of thumb that I gave was that you couldn't, um, if you're looking at four measure as the standard length in, in a piece, then you can't have a two measure phrase. And so instead you'll look at that two measure uh, as, as something that's an extension. And um, I'm not going to grade you on you know, identifying where the extension is, but I talked about the basic idea of if you have you know, two measures extra that are repeating the previous two measures or uh, are sequencing the previous two measures, um, then that would be something that you would identify as the extension in the pattern. Sometimes you don't have that and you just have an extra two measures at the end. Um, so you have to, you know, just kind of look at the context of, of that and try to make sense of it somehow. Um, but at any rate, that is the, the basic um, concept of the phrase and semi-phrase. Then we talked about different types of cadences which is um, the harmonic articulation of the end of a phrase. And so the uh, cadences that we talked about, which we'll review, um, having to do with harmonic formulas are authentic, half, plagal, and deceptive. So you should be able to define those. Those are reviewed. Um, and then you should be able to talk about the um, types that the author Stein refers to as exceptional. And so um, those were um, listed as then shifted, and that's basically just the cadence chord. And be sure that you use the term cadence chord um, in most of these descriptions of exceptional types. So in a shifted cadence, the cadence chord is not on the downbeat. So if, it, if the cadence chord is located on um, you know, any other part of the measure besides the downbeat, then you'll call it shifted. A delayed cadence is one in which 
the cadence chord sounds, but at the moment that it sounds, then you have non-harmonic tones in upper voices. So I talked about the importance of the bass line of indicating when the harmony changes. So um, that is a situation with a delay cadence, and you can have a cadence which is both shifted and delayed. So the, the cadence chord could occur on something other than the downbeat, um, and at that point have non-harmonic tones that are sounding, and they typically resolve soon, immediately, within the measure usually. Um, but those are the first two types. And then um, we talked about uh, implied cadences that are missing the root of the cadence chord. So the cadence chord sounds, but it doesn't have the root. Um, of extended cadences, That's, those are cadences in which the cadence chord is extended uh, beyond a single measure in length. Um, and so that, we talked about different methods of doing that, but that's the basic idea. Evaded is a cadence in which you have an extension at the end of the phrase, so longer than four measures, and one in which you have a, a, a modulation that occurs at the end of the phrase. So it starts in one key, and instead of cadencing the key that the beginning of the first four measures uh, indicate, then it modulates and cadences evades you know, the key that you originally expected and cadences in, in a different uh, key. So uh, we also talked about the uh, elided cadence, which is overlapped. Um, that's a situation in which you have the uh, cadence chord sounding at the same time uh, that another phrase has already begun. So um, those you should be able to define, and then I'll give you a few cadences in which you would indicate uh, whether or not it was authentic, half plagal, or deceptive, and then look to see if any of those six exceptional types would apply. And I'll, I'll pick examples where they do apply to see if you know those terms. Um, so be prepared to talk about that. We talked about then different combinations of phrases. So that has to do with phrase um, construction. And um, so what I talked about was the use of the terms um, parallel and contrasting period. So you should know those terms. Um, and we talked about the use of small case letter names to indicate uh, the phrase construction, the phrase structure. And so uh, you definitely want to uh, be you know, comfortable with that and be able to identify those uh, situations. So I'll give you something like, uh, that, and you would say that that is a parallel period. I'll just abbreviate with PP. And there was one time that I mentioned that was exceptional, and that's the three-part period. So be sure that you have looked up the definition of this term. So generally, a period is two phrases. But this exceptional type is um, three phrases. It's the smallest ternary pattern. So three phrases in total, with the first phrase and the third phrase being identical. So here's a situation where the second phrase is parallel to the first and third phrase. And you also then have this situation uh, as well. So both of those are examples of uh, three-part period, and then you should know um, the term contrasting. So contrasting period would be two phrases that uh, the beginning measures of each aren't parallel, so remember that Stein was a little bit more uh, liberal in using the term parallel, so Stein just looks at the first measure of the two units 
you know, so I'm on this period a lot of you know the beginning of the antecedent and the beginning of the consequent phrase. So you should know those terms, antecedent and consequent, and discussing uh, periods. So that was something that was um, an exceptional type. The other exceptional type was modified parallel period. And that is a situation that looks like it is a contrasting period. So if you have an example, I'm going to give you some um, sight singing examples. If you have something that looks like it's, it's two phrases in length and it looks like it is a contrasting period, check to see if the end of the antecedent phrase might be parallel to the beginning of the consequent phrase. And if that's the case, then you would identify that as a modified parallel period. All right, then I talked about the idea of exact repetition. So that if you have a written out repeat and every note is exactly the same, you will identify that as a repeated phrase. So you wouldn't identify this as a parallel period identified as a repeated phrase. So these are exactly the same thing. They're just notated differently. So and this can occur, you know, within the context of a, a longer uh, group of phrases. So you could have something like this. And so this would be the same as that. And so this is, you would describe that as a contrasting period with a repeated um, consequent phrase. So So be able to look out for that, you know, just you know, put a little X through that just when you see it's an exact repetition. If it has one note different, and so if it has one note different, then you wouldn't call it a, an exact repetition, but instead you would say that that's a parallel phrase. So something like this would be a phrase group. And so I talked about three phrases. Um, as long as they're not a three-part period, if you have three phrases and you don't have any uh, consecutive repetition, then you'll call it a phrase group. And so I went through the different types of, of uh, phrase groups that are possible. I then talked about four phrases, which equals a period and with a, a double period. And with double periods, then like in talking about a period, you'll use the terms parallel and contrasting. So you don't use parallel and contrasting when talking about a phrase group. It's only with periods and double periods. So if we have four phrases, so something like this, then this would be a, a parallel double period because you compare the beginning of the first and the third phrase to determine if it's parallel or contrasting. So I'll just put here parallel double period. And that would be the answer if I gave you something like this. Remember though that if you have exact repetition, then this is going to be viewed the same way as this. And so you would say that this is a contrasting period that is repeated. All right, so that's that basic idea of uh, repetition and consecutive repetition. So whether it's the phrase that's repeated or whether it's a period that's repeated.